Welcome, Ajay. It's a pleasure to have you as always. Uh, good to see a friend, good to see a mentor, good to see an ex-boss. And still at it, uh, your hardware dreams, your software dreams, I've learned a lot from you. So I want you to actually go back a little bit and tell me how was it in the 70s and 80s? Because first of all, you're a bunch of young entrepreneurs all getting together, different backgrounds, and you had a vision and you wanted to build uh, India's first uh, multiprocessor Unix operating system server. How was the journey? Uh, what were all the pain points that you went through and what did you realize after going See, actually, that? after six of us left DCN, our dream was, you know, microprocessor was just appearing. So our dream was to take the microprocessor and change the world. So that's the kind of concept we had in our mind. And we wanted to create a computer company. But, uh, but the amount of money we had was very limited because six of us putting together 1.86 lakhs is not going to make a computer company. Wow, so, that's an amazing number. Yeah, <laughs> so that's how we started. But uh, uh, the other thing that was a challenge at that time was that if you wanted to design and make a computer in India, you had to have a license from the government. And since we were a small little company, when we went to the government, they said, sorry, we won't give you a license. So we were, in the meantime, we started a little marketing company and our whole objective was to create some cash. So we went and bought some products from people like calculators from Televista, etc. and started marketing. And in the meantime, we kept thinking and creating this whole idea of the computer company. So we had, we had already formulated which product we'll make as the first product. And uh, then we found that UP government was sitting with a license. So we went to them and said, why can't we join hands and do something together? And since we came from DCM, they could realize that we knew what we were doing. Uh, they agreed to do that. So that's how Hindustan Computers Limited was yeah. formed. So very, very kind of resounding name. So I guess it was already registered. No, you see, those days, if you yeah. wanted the name Hindustan, you couldn't get it. That's right. You had to be a big company or a government company. But since we were a joint sector company, we got the name. Lovely. And the name was very critical for us because the moment an account executive of our company walked into any customer, the name Hindustan allowed him easy entry. So that's why we named it Hindustan. So as I learned much later, when Dr. C.K. Prahlad used to teach me at uh, Michigan, he used to say A is greater than R. And it's always meant that if you have aspirations, resources will happen. And that's exactly what happened when we started. We had no resources, but only aspirations. And we really got all the resources to put the company together. So as we started to grow, we came up with similar issues because technology import was a major challenge. So we decided to do a lot of things ourselves. So as you rightly said, we, we picked up a Unix from AT&T and around that we created a commercial version of Unix. And we added a lot of tools to it to make it more commercial. And then later on, we you know, created multiprocessor, fine-grained Unix type of product. So we kept improving. But from the time we started in 1976, in 10 years, we were number one IT company in the country. It's a brilliant story because in a way, it was also bootstrapping. Yes. Because in those days, no one called a VC. No angel, no VC, no nothing. No one's going to give you money, as you said. Yes. And so it's a brilliant journey. Now, coming to once you had the product ready and you showed up on the shores of the US, you ran into some other problems. And I think I joined your journey peripherally at that moment because I used to be with HP at that time. Mm. And we noticed that. Uh, what happened there uh, when, we, when we actually had the product? You see, we, uh, McKinsey came to us and said, you are India's largest IT company. We want to do a project with you. And, uh, uh, they came up with this whole idea of how to make entry into the United States. So entry strategy for United States and they felt that the multi-processor product that we had was outstanding and it had something really going for it. So we decided let's go and take some loan. So we went and took some loan from ICICI and went and started in Silicon Valley, set up the factory, got orders. But challenge was that when we made, when we were actually wanting to deliver the product, one of the companies who had placed a huge order on us got bought out. So that order in a manner vanished. Some other orders were there. But then, then we also discovered that our power supply was not okay. We needed certification for that for the United States. So a lot of these problems came up and in a manner, a business which looked very good got 
really destroyed. So what we did was we pivoted. And what we did at that stage was to take a lot of our engineers who were in Unix, etc., etc., great capability. We started putting them in R&D labs of Hewlett Packard and other companies. And that's how we sort of moved on to engineering software as a, as a service. Yeah, that, that was my first introduction. And I think you had Arjun there. Yeah, true. And you had Raj Sirohi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we had Radha Basu. Right. And so that's that that was basically the pivot. Yes. Where you pivot. started doing engineering services yes. to begin with. And of course, now you do a whole lot of other things. But the hardware vision, hardware passion never died in you. Never. It looked as though that trajectory continued because we did have engineering services at, at HCL. Now, coming to the 90s and early 2000s, at least that's when I got the opportunity to spend more time with you. You were doing this My India campaign. And one, one really good thing I learned from you is how to kind of simplify a campaign and make it resonate, right? So the Aspire bit comes because people look at something and they aspire. But a campaign in its heart is very, very simple. So what you're doing with Epic today, what you're doing with your book release, all of that comes through. And, and you want to actually replicate this entire digital village and digital startup concept, which That's you're right. anyway yeah. working on yeah. with Triple ID, uh, Triple ID Delhi, I think, yes. right? Yes. So you want to replicate that in uh, Telangana and we, uh, because we've got really fantastic support from the government and T-Hub, we'd love to see that happen. You see, what I see is that uh, within Epic, our whole objective is to have, go towards making India a hardware product nation. You see, if you look at the software piece, it took off and today is $200 billion. But where are they? When they started, they started all with services. And as they kept growing, the services business started to commoditize. And literally every fellow in the world was doing services. Then Indian software companies innovated and got better and better and started at doing transformation type of products so that that improved their margins. But basic services, the margins kept going down. Right. Now that's the challenge of India. India is a services country and not a product country. I think 10 years ago, something called iSpirit got set up in yes. uh, Bangalore and a lot of people like Nandan Nilkani and all supported it. And they created this whole idea of India as a software product country. Now we want to do something similar in hardware. So what we see today India has done very, very well in creating scale in manufacturing. But what India has not done is create depth in manufacturing. So there's a lot of scale, but no depth. So from a design capability perspective, I think we've also evolved. We've gone up the value chain. Um, that I know because I see a lot of people coming back from NVIDIA. NVIDIA is here. They do design. One big piece that we missed out, which I think you were part of, which was the semiconductor center in Chandigarh, but it, it went sideways because of policies. Uh, where do you think the policies are today? Do you think it's really ripe at this stage that the private sector, the government policies, all this stuff that you went through is completely removed and you just come in, you have a cookie cutter approach, you figure out which vertical and just make a digital village happen here. Do you think we're there? We are not there. Okay. I think a lot more needs to be done. That's where our role of Epic comes in. We want to help create that ecosystem. We are a Section 8 company. We're not interested in profits. We want to really give back to the country. So our whole objective is can we work with different state governments and create an ecosystem for design and development and manufacturing of products. Yes. And that's really what we want to achieve. Yeah. And in that, if we can influence the government, central government and state government in creating positive policies to make that happen, that is essential. You know how it happened in DARPA? The DARPA model is what we were we implemented in India with IDEX in, in uh, Ministry of Defense. We believe that the DARPA model is something that needs to be followed by every state government and central government. And if that model, where you challenge a startup or challenge a company and say, can you make this product for us? If you can make this product for us, 50% of the money we will give you. So they make the product. And once they make the product, the government gives them business. And that creates a, wish, a virtuous cycle of development of startups and MSMEs. That is a section. So the, uh, the beauty of it is Epic is a Section 8 company. Uh, most of the hubs that you're setting up, the design village, right? 
as well as a, a startup village is all going to be section 8 companies to begin with yeah, yeah, yeah. so we are we at tihub is all, we are also a section 8 company and the mandate is to basically impact the state right mm. which is basic a, along these technology lines which is through products which is basically making people's lives easier whether it's in agriculture whether it's financial inclusion mm. whether it's education mm. so all of the stuff that you have talked about in your like kind of outline for epics which area and we're getting people who are setting up manufacturing in telangana in a big way so yes. apple's here foxconn is here but there are more manufacturing facilities we still have not been able to tie up mm. with with a real good foundry mm. in depth mm. so that is my concern what do you what do you foresee because people are raising are talking about 8 billion 10 billion dollars going into karnataka or gujarat do you think a foundry will come up in, in you see order? what's happened is that I have put in many, many, many years ago. I started talking about putting up some collector pads, and somehow or the other, the policies were just not good enough. This time is the first time when their policy is good. Basically, what the government is now saying that if you your investment is going to be five billion dollars, thirty fifty percent we will pay. Then the states are also pitching in and saying they'll pay another twenty percent. So seventy percent is a huge number. Which is not there anywhere in the world. The United States gives you thirty percent. Right. So com- competitively, we are better placed. But the challenge that is there for the country is that every country wants semiconductors, and therefore the demand for people who can set up with their technology is very very high. So the this time when they uh, uh, invited proposals for people to set up, all the proposals that came had something or the other missing. and therefore none of them got up by the government because remember one thing if the government is going to pay 70% they better know that there is proper business plan they better know that something it will get sold it should not be that 10 years later you're producing and selling nothing true so importantly that as what has kept it in a very slow careful model like i, I, I should now i see sense. now i see that one major thing has happened which is micron taking a decision Now, moment Micron took the decision, a lot of interest is there globally, and so I think you will see at least in the next uh, four four years, five years, I think within the next twelve to fourteen months, you'll have at least two uh, silicon fabs approved. Okay. You should have one or two compound semiconductor fabs approved. You should have at least couple of OSAT ones approved. Now, when we were looking at it. <coughs> Always, we me- me- mention that there are a few missing pieces in the strategy, and one of the missing pieces was we were not looking at an R and D facility. If you look at an ecosystem, R and D is absolutely critical yes. because the process development has to consistently take place. Correct. So, R and D is something that uh, the government has now decided, and they will make the SCL facility in Mohal mm-hmm. as the R and D facility. So if that becomes an R and D facility, then the ecosystem will be complete. Because at one end there is a DLI which is encouraging uh, fabless startups to uh, uh, come in, and at the other end is R and D. Now all of those are happening, and the last piece which is creating people. We don't have enough people for manufacturing, especially. We have the uh, people who can design, but we don't have people to for manufacturing. So that. Uh, that paper has also been created, and there's a plan of creating thirty thousand people in the next five years. It's wonderful because if you look at where we are today, um, hardware is like becoming part of our everyday life. Now, most of the hardware, as as you rightly pointed out, is coming from elsewhere. Yes, and that's causing a lot of pressure on these startups because of import, export, tariffs. Everything is kind of confusing to the tax people themselves. So sometimes things get stuck, or the customs. those things have not improved as much if things are done internally and everything is sourced so that dependency is gone and we move up the quality because one of the issues perceptive i am not saying uh it's there but perceptively when we kind of rate ourselves in software people have now recognize hey these guys are good they can write products they can do services they can write applications but when it comes to hardware i think we are a little bit behind in terms of perception even though we might be producing really good products So I think a little bit of that has to happen. And what do you think about JVs in general, with with say foundry partners? 
because they have the expertise. Can they expedite this? Because typically the gestation period of a, any kind of a fab or a foundry is 10 years, right? Everything will be a JV. Okay. All the decisions will be around JV because the government is very particular that uh, technology partners also come in and the technology partners also invest. So you will see JVs definitely happening. It's not going to be just Indian companies doing that because Indian companies just do not have the experience. So you need experience, you need funding, you need technology. All of these are required. Fantastic. That's really good to hear because I think, as you said, it's a deliberate plan. I think all the mistakes from the past yes. have been reviewed. Yes. And folks like you who were part of that journey are able to contribute. Yes. Like if it comes to software and products, I'll be able to easily tell them what are all the pitfalls. Mm. But we've gone past that hump when it comes to software. Mm. Hardware is slightly different because it's also more susceptible to global changes, yeah, yeah. Uh, economic tariffs, yes. sanctions. Yes. So we have to become very self-sufficient, even vis-a-vis -vis the JV partners. Mm. So should we take a measured kind of thing, hedged approach to JV partners saying from different parts of the world so that you don't get locked out in some so these are these are everything has become global unfortunately yes, right? absolutely true and the other thing is that in electronics there's nothing called doing everything yourself this is a global uh, supply chain so you need to decide which products you will make which sub assemblies you will make which components you will make and the rest you will import right and for that there should be a policy <coughs> which, which is encouraging as opposed to and we also need everyone to be aware yes the entire ecosystem i'm talking about the customs i'm yeah, talking yeah. about the tax guy yeah, yeah. Because if they are not hand in glove, then small companies suffer. So, you know, for example, uh, one of the things that uh, we have been working from Epic is to uh, help the government in creating a right to repair policy. Because we strongly believe that uh, there's a huge opportunity for people to repair in this country. But yes. they are denied that responsibility because they never get hold of spares and, you know, right. all the circuit diagrams, etc. of products. So now what will happen is that if that policy comes in, every vendor will have to register on a portal, provide their, their spare parts price list, provide uh, uh, training for people if required, and also provide all the circuit diagrams. So anybody in the country can repair. Now, the challenge that's coming into this country is that unlike the West where there's a thinking of buy and throw, we can't afford to do that because the number of people that are there who can buy a used one is also very large. That's correct. So, you you know, we are, we, are the, we are the kind of people who have this whole habit of never throwing things. Even a toothbrush is never thrown. You know, you use it for something else. Clothes, you wear a shirt and then your youngest, younger uh, brother wears it and then it's given away to the staff. So, you actually reuse a few. Now, that's the kind of concept we need in, even in electronics, which becomes more sustainable. So, if you look at T-Hub, I think it was set up to actually make all of this happen. Mm -hmm. The reason it was called Hub was we had excellent academic institutions here, right from core sciences to engineering like IIIT, Hyderabad, IIT, BITS, to uh, biotech, bioinformation. We have labs, government labs. We have a government which is very proactive. Uh, we didn't have a VC ecosystem. Now there are about 10, 12 VCs who have actually relocated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff is going on. Mm. So somewhere, I mean, it's our desire. And uh, hopefully you've seen T-Works, you've seen T-Hub. It's our desire to be part of that epic movement yes. and actually drive it. So we'd be very happy to actually be part of that journey. And uh, we'd like to see you more often with your team. Mm -hmm. Sure, I actually, some of them I, I that's do. the reason why I wanted to come here and see myself personally as to what's going on. Because I, I've heard so much about it and I was very keen to see it. So there was always this dubious thing, yeah, I mean, uh, like the marketing department here is overactive, right? So we might be doing more PR than what's going on. So unless you come, uh, you won't see it. So once you see something like T-Works, I don't think you'll find uh, a lab where people can actually come in and make a full prototype yes. and actually take it out because yes. it's, it's got the equipment, it's got the backing and we are seeing a lot more hardware companies also coming here like you mentioned Micron, so mm. we have Micron, AMD, Intel, folks do mm. visit. Mm. It's just that if we get that kind of well-rounded kind of vision from Epic and, and 
even a small kind of blueprint saying hey can you help us with x y and z i think it will be a great partnership yeah, yeah. see we are talking to a lot of state governments various institutions there is no concept in this country of creating products in the curriculum biggest challenges are curriculum is very limited so you have electronics they you will teach basic electronics nobody is taught how to make a product okay. same way there are very few btech programs on vlsm that's right so what we did last year was to recommend to the government that we must start btech programs in vlsi design and products yes which got approved last year and to this year onwards you will see many universities adopting that but the people availability is still a problem that's correct so i think what we want to do is get a blueprint from you saying that okay what are the categories of uh, skill sets that you need and telangana i think the biggest impact is we want to actually make sure that the aspirations of the blue blue collar and the rural people because manufacturing hubs are going to be set up yes all over right yes. so it's not the infra infra will be good connectivity will be good but can that local plant be supported by a workforce mm. which is kind of getting trained or retrained yes so we want to kind of create that kind of a yeah, platform yeah yeah it is very essential so that's where i think your insights what is changing will help because a lot of the rural areas in telangana have good colleges they have good hubs uh, they have some facilities which can be all transformed like you, you see we've seen it very much clearly it doesn't matter where you come from people right. are the same correct just give them the environment and they'll succeed so i think it'll be wonderful to have what 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 else caught your fancy when you were walking in tea hub and tea works because some of the some of the tea hub folks would like to hear a little bit more i about. haven't spent as much time in tea hub as i've spent in tea works but i'm very impressed with the whole concept of it's been created by the telangana government where in tea hub they've given you a facility now you're on your own you need to run it on your own you need to earn your revenues i think that's a very very good concept because it just brings more uh co- consciousness about cost consciousness about doing your own thing and being able to i think it's ownership yeah. and then it's basically yeah. thriving on that because yes. that's actually the role of the government because yeah. beyond a point they don't interfere that's beautiful yeah. whereas in some places there are too many policies and it becomes very bureaucratic that's this right. is very open so that's, right. that's why we want to actually take that first step and work with epic and and really yeah, get this yeah. to happen i think there's a lot of uh, collaborative work we can do where Uh, we can take a lot of the capability that you've developed to other states and other institutions and we can send a lot of startups to come and work here and uh, create products you know why should we replicate the same thing in many many places in the country right right no, actually uh, there is infer leverage uh, there is uh, policy makers which are aligned mm-hmm. the government is aligned and we want impact to happen and i think given your track record from the 70s I mean from where you started with 1.86 lakhs <laughs> and you made it happen and uh, it's amazing so we'd like you to really bless us and and be part of that journey but going back now you're here for another reason too you launching your book just aspire and you just talked about prelad where a is greater than r so i guess there's some connection there what would you like to tell aspiring or budding entrepreneurs or or the youth uh what is your message to them what will happen in the next 5 7 10 years that is exciting see one of the things that i tell everyone is that uh, not just entrepreneurs but everybody is that don't don't get focused on just one thing in life have a range of subjects that you should know so i call it a t you got t hub here t is perfect because the the length of the t is the focus area for you. so let's say you're a computer science guy you better know everything in that but the rest of the team is meant for you to develop other capabilities with other skills and i think that makes you a complete person if you just do one thing i mean when east when i started iit hyderabad i told uh, uh, the director i said no one nerds coming out because that's a complete waste of what they are doing and you know what happens in iit is nobody goes to the humanities class they just don't learn those things. So in IIT Hyderabad they have they created something called factors and they had 36 of them where you could choose and you know create a much more well rounded person 
So I think that is an essential part that I tell all entrepreneurs that you know, yes, you should be very focused, very uh, passionate about what you're doing. But if you have the aspirations, you will succeed. It's not just resources that matter. And the next thing that I tell a lot of uh, uh, CEOs of startups is that learn how to sell. A lot of the startups have very poor capability in two areas, accounting and finance and uh, selling. So they, they, they think that if they create a great product, it will sell on its own. It doesn't happen. So you need to know how to sell. Now, selling is not something that you can't learn. There are enough training programs available. Get a coach, get yourself trained and do a, be a very good salesman. So in my book, I have one chapter which is on salesmanship. I call it a life skill. It's something that you must know. And the other part is how to manage people. So I have a chapter in my book which is called The People Tree. And there I've given lots and lots of examples of how to manage people. So I think uh, one interesting thing that you mentioned very early on to me was managing down is good. Managing upwards is equally important. Managing sideways, both from an internal context yes. and an external context. Yes. Internal would be your peers. Yeah, yeah. External would be the customers. Yes, true. So it's a 360 degree view, yes. which which uh, people often forget. They only look at, uh, you know, it's like cricket, you know, you some sort of offside hill, but you can So, you know, that kind of thing doesn't work. Coming to sports, mm. what keeps you busy? I mean, I know you sponsored me to play a few cricket games at <laughs> HCL, <laughs> but, but what uh, what keeps you busy? Is it cricket or is it some, your grandkids playing? I know all of everybody plays cricket among all my grandkids in Goa. But, you know, what keeps me busy is music. So, I, you know, one of my passions was singing. But later on, I mean, I used to just sing like that. But five years ago, I got myself a teacher and now I can earn how to sing. So, I keep improving. It's, I'm a long way away from really knowing so well. But the point is that you, you put some attention onto something and you improve. So, I think those are the kind of things that uh, I've been doing. And of course, uh, a lot of work in philanthropy. So, I've been giving a lot of uh, you know support and help during the COVID days, for example, like this a lot. Of work. And uh, recently, I launched a, a scholarship for uh, about uh, uh, 21 uh, institutions in the country for people who would like to be uh, uh, go to engineering institutes and don't have the money to do it. Fantastic. So, I call it the Aspire Scholarship. Actually, uh, also uh, one of the institutes selected is IIT as well. Wonderful. Um, I think. Uh, they will probably get inspired, get inspired <laughs> to aspire from this point. But I, I, I think uh, the one, um, how should I call it, indelible image of you, which which you haven't changed, is the ease with which you can interact with anyone, anywhere, anytime, right? And you have this uh, innate kind of uh, body language, which is very inclusive, and speech. So. I think even in the next 10-15 years, hopefully we'll see more of you here. <laughs> You'll continue to inspire people to aspire. But I think uh, going back to those two uh, things that you specifically mentioned, the ability to sell and the ability to actually kind of make sure you're responsible from a p and perspective because without cash flow, you're yeah, not, yeah. right? Is something which uh, could be factor, as you said. And I think there are people picking up aspects of what you talk about. IIT Hyderabad, but I think you should make it a habit, just go around the country, show up every 10 days here, we'll, we'll host you here and, and people will be very thrilled actually. Yeah, kind this of, is something that most startups miss out. True. And I've seen them fail when they scale. And the reason why they fail when they scale is they, have, they don't have these two things properly put in place. And the fractal, like for example, the ability to communicate yeah, yeah. at the right the point. Soft right side box. Wonderful. Do you have any questions? That you want to ask of me? What are you doing now? I'm just tooling around as, <laughs> as always. I, I'm a techie. I like startups. I spend about a day, a week here to drive the T-Hub vision. And it's a real honor to have you here because uh, luckily these last two weeks I've met three of my bosses. Who oh, is it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I met Lakshmi of Cognizant. Mm. I've met you now. Mm. And just before that, Anand had visited. Anand ah, Deshpande. Okay. So I said, I'll have a podcast with all three of you here <laughs> on a panel because each of you bring very different skills yeah. and experiences uh, to the table. 
Pradesh, once again, thank you very much for taking the time and coming here. Uh, as I said, it's an honor, it's a privilege. Uh, hope to see you more often here and, and inspire a bunch of young kids. There are 250 uh, startups right in this building. Some of you, some of them will be up there. And then there are 4,000 startups across the state. Mm. And quite a few of them have aspirations. Mm. And quite a few of them also want to kind of do stuff with products. Mm. And the education programs are getting upgraded because I know for a fact that I do contribute. I do teach once in a while. So we want to see you more often here and we'll get ex-parliamentarians like the gentleman <laughs> you met, Palam Raju. We'll get a bunch of those guys who actually went to college. Uh, some folks didn't go to college and became parliamentarians. <laughs> I'm not talking about them, but I'm talking about really smart people who want to change India and, and get it to where you want it to go from a hardware perspective. You know, last time I came here to launch my book at Tech Mahindra University and uh, I met Mr. Jayesh Ranjul and he specifically mentioned that come to Hyderabad, visit Tia. So that's yes. why I came here.